Um, <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. My name is Morgan Pershing. I am the Community Engagement Manager at Sacramento Public Library. And thank you for being with us today. We are joined by two creators of the graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, Japanese Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. Before we get started, and as we wait for people to trickle in, I wanna tell you a few things about the library. If you like graphic novels, we have a graphic novel book club that meets every third Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. And in fact, we have many book clubs and my lovely assistant Kayla will be putting a link to where you can find, oh, she already did, she's faster than I am. Um, we've got romance, sci-fi, bring your own book. So book groups to fit every, every like. And I would also like to uh, make a few comments about graphic novels. Um, the term graphic novel is really just a marketing term for comics or sequential art. And in libraries, we often hear from parents that comics aren't real reading. Um, I'd like to dispel that myth. In reality, comics are more than real reading because your brain is synthesizing art and words together. When reading them, you are using both sides of your brain. So your brain is actually more active than when you're just reading prose. And in addition, reading comics involves using your intuition and imagination more so than prose. And finally, the medium is so rich when it comes to offerings for adults. Fiction, history, memoir, there are so many great graphic novels out there. So I probably am preaching to the choir now because you are all here and we are going to talk about a graphic novel, but I always wanna get that information out there. Um, and then as far as Sacramento Public Library, our commitment to creating opportunities for our community is stronger than ever. Whether it's bringing one of a kind author experiences such as Authors Uncovered, we offer virtual programs for all ages from story times to book clubs to team programming to English conversation groups. And then some housekeeping, please put your questions for our, for our creators in the Q&A. Uh, Ross and Frank will answer questions towards the end. And one more time, if you need to access the closed captioning, you can click on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Now, if you post in chat, your comments will be public. We ask that you keep the conversation civil and respectful. Anyone violating this code of conduct will be blocked. And a recording will be made available on our website, saclibrary.org later this week, as well as being updated to, uploaded to our YouTube channel. So let's get this conversation started. I am pleased to welcome both Frank Abe and Rosh Ishikawa to our stage. Frank Abe wrote and directed the PBS film of the largest organized resistance to incarceration, Conscience and the Constitution. In addition, he won an American Book Award for John Okada, The Life and Rediscovered Work of the Author of No, No Boy, which is an amazing book that everyone should read. No, No Boy, it's so good and is co-editing co a new anthology of incarceration literature for Penguin Classics. He blogs at resistors.com. Ross Ishikawa is a cartoonist and animator living in Seattle. He is working on a graphic novel about his parents and their coming of age during World War II. His work is online at rossishikawa.com. And we, are going, we put all these links in the chat so you can check them out. And finally, I would like to introduce our facilitator, the Honorable Kara Ueda of the Sacramento Superior Court. Take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan. I really appreciate it. It is a real pleasure to be here this evening with you. And I really do appreciate the education about graphic novels and how they engage our brain in different ways using both sides. I didn't realize that, but now I've come to appreciate in particular, I think the way that I read this graphic novel and how I did have to focus on both the words and on the images and how like, I did have to think about things in a different way than if I had just been reading a book that had um, only words and no images. So I am very excited tonight to be here with both Frank Abe and Ross Ishikawa. Um, I wanna tell you just a little bit about why um, I think first, for any of you who have read the graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, you'll know that two of the three individuals who are highlighted in the novel or in the book are from Sacramento or from the Sacramento area. The third one is from Seattle, where both Frank and Ross are from. 
And so I do think it's particularly special tonight to be able to bring the two communities together. I think most of um, the bulk of their prepared remarks are going to focus on the two individuals who were from the Sacramento area, Mitsue Endo and Hiroshi Kashiwagi, Kashigawa, excuse me. Um, the graphic novel we hear by reviews really does pack a punch into it. It is a relatively slim novel, but has a lot in it regarding the incarceration, as well as the resistance efforts that were led by three, or were made by three um, fairly young individuals. And I have a particular interest in this because my family, my grandparents, my father, and other of my relatives were also incarcerated um, both at Tule Lake and at other um, camps around the country. So again, I'm very excited to be here this evening and I have the pleasure of moderating or facilitating this discussion. But before we get into a real Q&A, um, Frank Abe has some slides that you would like to share um, to start, or sort of lay some groundwork and some background um, about some of the stories that are set forth in We Hear by Refuse. So Frank, you've already been introduced by Morgan, so I will turn it over to you so you can begin sharing your screen and talk to us a little bit. Thanks, Kara. I mean, it's a graphic novel, so it's important just to see what, what we're talking about in, in the pictures. And I'm so, so glad to be here in Sacramento Public Library uh, because you said the characters are from Sacramento. But also, as you mentioned, a lot of the families from Sacramento were sent directly to Chile Lake, uh, either via Assembly Center or after that. So, um, you know, telling the Chile Lake story was very important to us uh, in, in getting the story out. We modestly call this the story of camp as you've never seen it before. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Just the idea that there was resistance to the camps is something that, as you probably know, we didn't talk about in the community 20 years ago. Uh, and there were uh, powerful reasons for that. I mean, there was a lot of people felt uh, she had to deny on one hand, can't be helped. A lot, a lot of folks felt to uh, go for broke, uh, you know, um, shoot the works, give 110 uh, percent, patriotic self-sacrifice uh, to prove one's loyalty. Um, the, neither of those two extremes made much sense, landed with me personally. So, you know, the story of resistance was one that I, I spent a lot of time to bring out. And uh, um, our book is also different in, in the sense that a lot of the books come before are told from the point of view of children in camp. Um, and when you do that, you have, you have characters, children don't really understand what's happening to them uh, in these complex events of World War II. You know, what's going on? Why are we locked up? Why do people hate us? Why are the grown-ups always fighting? Um, so our story is told from the point of view of three characters who are in their early 20s, people who have agency, people who have, who, are, who must make choices uh, about every decision demanded of them by the government. So these are the three characters I'm going to show you. Um, with my screen here. This is Jim Okutsu from Seattle. Uh, he refuses to be drafted from the camp at Minidoka until his rights as a citizen were first clarified. Uh, Hiroshi Kashiwagi was born in Loomis, northeast of Roseville. He resists government pressure to sign a loyalty oath at Chile Lake. <clears throat> and we'll discuss more about that later. He later yields to family pressure to renounce his U.S. citizenship under the duress of camp. And um, their stories are interwoven with that of another Sacramento resident, uh, Sacramento native, whose name is already in the history books and you studied it in law school, I'm sure, Kara, uh, Mitsuya Endo. Uh, she's known as a plaintiff in the Supreme Court test case that contested her imprisonment. Uh, but for the first time in this book, we reveal the person behind the name on the legal briefs. So I wanna focus first on her. Endo was a key punch operator for the California Department of Employment. Uh, this drawing here that Ross gave us was based on a photo found in by a former state employee, uh, Lorna Fong. So thanks for that, Lorna. Uh, the atmosphere in Sacramento after Pearl Harbor was one of war hysteria, fueled by fear and ignorance of the other, of a Japanese American community that that whites very knew very little about and and was suspicious of. In fact, the California State Personnel Board suspended all employees of Japanese ancestry after the Pearl Harbor. Among their hysterical claims was one that, that Nisi like Nisi Endo were citizens of Japan and therefore subjects of the Japanese emperor. Um, this of course upset the employees who are Nisei, American born, Sacramento born uh, citizens, including Endo. And what's little known is that 63 of these Nisei state employees in Sacramento 
met at night at one of their homes and organized under the leadership of an income tax examiner named Sumio Miyamoto uh, and others who, to contest their uh, termination. We don't name Sumio in, in the novel, but he was he's one of the characters here. Uh, JACL president Saab Kido put them in touch with an attorney in San Francisco, uh, James Purcell, who took on their case. But in the middle of the class action complaint, the army evicted, as you know, all Japanese Americans from Sacramento. Uh, the Endos lived on the edge of Sacramento, Japantown. And as you all know, few traces of old Japantown remain. Uh, but this aerial view captures really how close it was to the south of the state capitol building, uh, Fifth and O Streets, Fifth and Sixth, oh, Sixth and O Streets. Uh, James Purcell was outraged by this mass eviction and detention, and he also saw that the only way to get back the jobs of his clients was to fight their detention by the army. He planned a legal strategy of challenging the incarceration, the, the eviction, with a petition of habeas corpus, Latin for produce the body. He went shopping for what, what he called the perfect plaintiff. And he found her in Mitsuya Endo, who was then detained at the Sacramento Assembly Center, located on a workers' camp 14 miles northeast of the city. Uh, Purcell chose Endo because she didn't speak Japanese or attend Jewish school, had a brother in the US Army. And this is her first decision point, saying, as you see, signal her agreement. Lawyers for the WRA, the however, feared the strength of her hate case and was moved to Topaz, Utah. Uh, the government sent its chief solicitor to offer her a chance to leave camp, which would, of course, moot their case. And this was Endo's second key decision point, to do its best for herself or act for the good of all. And these are her words uh, drawn from a letter she wrote to Jim Purcell. I am willing to go as far as I can on this case. Uh, it meant staying in camp for another two full years, and we show how she had second thoughts about that. But her case does reach the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which rules the Roosevelt administration had no legal right to detain admittedly loyal U.S. citizens for an indeterminate amount of time. And you can read all that in the legal briefs students have. But until now, you wouldn't have read about Mitzi's personal reaction when she got the news of Topaz which was to grab the hand of her good friend, uh, Janet Masuda, and dance around her barrack. Uh, this was an unknown detail for which we are indebted to uh, Priscilla Uchida and uh, Alyssa Uchida of Sacramento, um, who learned it from their aunt and great aunt, Janet Masuda. So that's the untold story of Mitsuya Endo. Our other Sacramento resident, uh, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, we pick up his story when he and his wife, I mean, he and his family, uh, were sharecropping on a farm in Penryn, also northeast of Roseville. Uh, they're sent first to the Marysville Assembly Center. Then he and so many Sacramento area residents are moved to the Tule Lake War Relocation Center up in Modoc County near Klamath Falls. Once in camp, the needs of the two different agencies uh, in overseeing the camps came together in a catastrophic bureaucratic bungle that forever divided Japanese America. First, um, JACL and others pressed the army to admit the Nisei into the armed services. Um, so it's seen as a way to, again, prove their loyalty by shedding their blood for America. Uh, but the army, having effectively branded the Japanese Americans in camp as untrustworthy by dint of locking them up, now, lead, now they now needed a reverse PR campaign to clear the volunteers from the camps as eligible for service. By the same token, the War Relocation Authority did not want to keep housing and feeding all, the, all these mouths in camp. They needed a way to clear the Nisei for resettlement to schools in the East and Midwest. And so they came up with what for them was a perfect paper trail, uh, a loyalty oath. So the Army and WRA combined their questions onto one form. And the two questions, are you willing to serve the Armed Forces of the United States in combat duty ever ordered? And the second, question 28, we use square and qualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the US from any all attack and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor. They thought it was simple. Uh, every, they thought everyone answered yes, no problem. But with no clear idea how they would use the answers to this questionnaire, 
and really a failure to give the Army recruiters in camp a simple FAQ to answer all the questions that people had. Um, all this application for leave clearance did was create an administrative nightmare. It created an administrative class of people who on paper had to be categorized as not loyal when they refused to answer questions 27, 28 for whatever reasons, because they objected to it, because it's confusing, uh, because they felt that to answer yes would be to volunteer for the army you know, and automatically enlist. So the government creates a class of people on paper who had to be considered disloyal. So I remember these people have committed no acts of disloyalty, no acts of disloyalty. No, all they've done is put down answers on a piece of paper under threat of prison time and fines. So on a fully understood questionnaire for which no one has any idea of the consequences. So my point being is the government that creates a class of disloyals, not the incarcerees, and they do so through a purely bureaucratic act. It's only disloyalty on paper, not by action. And uh, check me if I'm wrong, Kara, but you can't be prosecuted for thought, only for your actions. So what our book does is to flip the usual question of loyalty as it's applied to Tuli Lake on its head. As several Tulians said at the time, it's not a question of our loyalty, it's the country that's not loyal to us, to its own principles, not loyal to the constitution. But there's more. Congress pressures the WRA to segregate the no's from the yeses, and JUCL demands protection for their loyalists in camp. So the agency, WRA, obliges by fortifying Tule Lake as its segregation center. It converts it from a WRA camp to a segregation center, a prison camp. Uh, and they move in 12,000 from all the camps who refuse to answer or answer no. It is, as you can see, a kind of prison colony. And when you have a prison, you inevitably create prison gangs. Uh, for the first time, our, our story shows how this change from a war relocation camp to a fortified segregation center created the conditions for unrest at Tule Lake, leading to pressures for in succession, repatriation to Japan, expatriation, denationalization, renunciation of citizenship, and ultimately deportation for many. Congress demands to strip the Nisei camp of their citizenship and deport everyone to Japan, an idea which incidentally we recently heard floated by the past administration uh, in relation to the children of undocumented immigrants, uh, undocumented migrants. That was prevented in 1942 by the 14th Amendment, which created birthright citizenship, of course, but the Attorney General obliges by drafting what's called the Denationalization Act, which for the first time enables a U.S. citizen to voluntarily renounce their citizenship during time of war. So the 18,000 people pushed into the segregation center can see how this government has abandoned or turned against them. All they have is their, uh, their, their skin, really, their ancestry. They, all they have is to find strength and pride in themselves and their racial ancestry, their racial identity. So this anger and frustration and isolation to like boil over into organization these are, which you know, we've no doubt heard, Kara, the so-called pro-Japan fanatics at Tule Lake. Uh, we show how these groups were a product of the duress of mass incarceration. After all, I stop and think, was there a back to Japan movement on the West Coast in Sacramento before the mass eviction from their homes? No, it was a product of camp. And Barbara Takei of, of Sacramento likens this to the formation of gangs in, in prison. It was this, in this environment that seven of every 10 Nisei at Tule Lake voluntarily surrendered the US citizenship, renounced it, including our character Hiroshi Tashiwagi. There was family meeting, caving the family pressure to renounce the citizenship, to keep the family together. As one character says, how convenient for the government to give us the chance to self-deport. And we walked right into their trap. But Hiroshi and others recruit another San Francisco attorney, Wayne Collins, who takes on the renunciation cases and wins a state of deportation for Hiroshi and others. Hiroshi returns to Sacramento on a show this on a bright sunny day, he said, only to find old friends in Tui Lake ignoring and, and, and cold shouldering him with a derogatory term of no, no boy. And uh, as you know, this is the division that exists in our community to this day. 
uh, because our community has embraced these divisions, which I maintain are created by the government. Uh, Hiroshi, uh, working as a librarian after the war, describes how Wayne Collins spent a decade to win back the citizenship that he had renounced. And I just want to read to you from the last page of the book. After 35 years, can you imagine my chagrin, my dismay, when I learned there was no law that required draft age Nisei to answer that loyalty questionnaire in camp? All those threats of prison and fines, all lies. I was angry all over again. At least I'm able to unburden myself uh, with others who are cast out from our own community, even to this day. To be an American is a privilege I appreciate. And if there's one thing I've learned is that America must unburden itself too. The government was wrong to single us out for exclusion based solely on our race. It was wrong then, and it would be wrong now. And whenever we see America turn against a people because of their race or their religion or their whatever, we won't just stand by. We won't just go along. I will speak up. I will see that every person gets a fair hearing. I will be the friend we didn't have or we needed one the most. It happened to us. We refuse to let it happen again. So that's that's the how our book ends. Uh, that's kind of the the under the sub the subtext of, of our novel uh, behind the drawings. And with that, I'll, I'll take a breath and and let Carl I'll take, toss it back to you. And Carl, you're muted. Thank you. I told myself I wouldn't make that mistake. I see it happen all the time now. But anyway, thank you so much, Frank. Um, I really appreciate all of that. There's a lot in there to unpack and to ask you some questions about. I do just want to ask you one question before I'm turning it over to Ross, who was going to talk to us a little bit about how some of the illustrations came about. But Frank, um, and I think it leads into what Ross is going to talk about. Um, the Mitsuo Endo case you had noted actually did gain, I guess, a little bit more um, notoriety or she's a little bit more well-known than the yeah. other two people in the book, but she actually isn't as well-known as some of the other people who I think are more in the history books, Fred Korematsu, Gordon right, Gordon Hirabayashi and Minasuke Asui. And I'm wondering um, what you think about that in terms of how that came to be, because her case, as you put forth in the book, actually had a really powerful effect on what happened um, for the subsequent release. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts as to her place in history and, and why it is that she is not as well known. There are two reasons, Kara. One was that she was a private person. She was a, a reluctant recruit to this lawsuit. And when it was over, she basically, she retreated to her personal life, her private life. She turned down all newspaper interviews. Uh, uh, she granted only two oral history interviews, which we used extensively. Um, and she just, you know, she felt, I, I've done my part. People know what I've done. I don't need to talk about, I need to broadcast it, as she put it. The other reason is that we don't know much, we don't know her name as well as Korematsu Hirabayashi and Yusui because she won. She won her case. And was, as you say, her case had this effect of forcing the government uh, to shut down all the and World Relocation Authority camps. We know the others because in the 1980s, uh, San Diego State, San Diego uh, professor uh, Peter Irons and researcher Eiko Herzig discovered some evidence uh, that led to the reopening of the Korematsu Hirabashi Nisui cases through the writ of error quorum notice, uh, uh, showing how the War Department suppressed information from the Supreme Court, uh, withheld it, and therefore their convictions were tainted. Uh, and in the 80s, there, was, uh, there were three uh, evidentiary hearings held in San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland, um, where the, the cases, the, the convictions were not overturned, but they were vacated, uh, which was almost a split. So, that publicity uh, in the 80s uh, is what has cemented their names uh, in, in the public consciousness. Uh, and Endo was a bit of a footnote in history because of her, again, her, her privacy and also because there was no way, oops, you couldn't reopen her case because it had already been settled. Um, and, and as, as you know, Korematsu, despite some rulings last year in the Roberts Court, 
uh, you know, Korematsu still effectively remains on the books uh, today as a loaded weapon. Right, and so you noted that she's a private person, but you were somehow able to get, I'm assuming, some additional information about her um, in order to put this book together. I was lucky to have dinner with her son, Wayne, in Chicago about three years ago. And um, he confirmed for me the one crucial detail that I needed to get a, a lot of the character. I, I knew who looked into, I knew who she actually wanted to do. So, you know, writing their dialogue and the personality was, was easy. Uh, and though I didn't want to contrive dialogue for her or make her out to be a person that she wasn't. Um, and I asked Wayne, did she have a nickname? Because me say, oh, they love each other, a nickname, like horse and punch, you know. Um, uh, and um, I, and I, I had an idea. I said, oh, yeah, everyone call, my mother, everyone called her Mitzi after the actress Mitzi Gaines. And I said, yes. Uh, Mitzi, yeah, if you know it's Mitzi. And, and it, it just, it, it's giving me an insight into her character as a, a, a typical Mitzi woman. Um, we also have the benefit of two oral history interviews uh, and her letters to, Wayne, to James Purcell. And with those, I can simply extrapolate her, her syntax and thoughts uh, onto the page. And I feel, you know, relatively accurate representation of the character. Okay, great. Um, I now want to turn it over to Ross, who um, is going to also share his screen and explain to us some of the development of the images and the illustrations that are in the book. So Ross? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Um, I, uh, can you see this? Okay. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> there, do you see that? Okay. Um, I wanted to go uh, do a couple of things. I, one was just to talk a little bit about um, how some of the scenes were constructed um, visually, and then also uh, talk about a particular scene, um, how that evolved over the course of this project. Um, so first, um, this is uh, 50, uh, Fifth and O Street, which is um, in the neighborhood of uh, Mitsui Endo's house. And, um, Frank uh, located this photograph um, and it conveniently has the uh, street crossing and a uh, notice, uh, uh, the, uh, the camp notice um, to show that it's a contemporary photo of the time and place. Um, we used, I used this as sort of a jumping off point to locate um, uh, a particular scene where Endo, the Endo family is packing up to go to camp. Um, but we wanted to show the proximity to the Capitol building and, um, um, and to, to show that uh, they were just in the shadow basically of the Capitol. Um, but you know, this house and this neighborhood is really uh, not there anymore. And so um, I went to Google Maps and found this uh, location just to set up the orientation. And then from that, I could construct um, the an approximation of uh, the neighborhood relative to the capital. And, um, and so that, that was kind of uh, the level of detail we tried to um, put in every scene. Um, and so this next section, I just wanna talk about sort of the evolution of, uh, of the collaboration um, between writers and uh, artists. Um, this was the initial treatment of a climactic scene in the endo story. Uh, I'll just do a quick read, um, page 68, full page, Topaz. It's December, 1944 and cold snow on the ground. Mitsu Endo is running from her block to her friend Janet one block away, holding a paper with several lines of writing. The only words uh, we can see are on top, Western Union. Page 69, Topaz, tall panel. Mitsui appears in the door of Janet's bar barrack, offering Janet the telegram. Mitsui, what is it? Mitsui, she's out of breath. This, just, just read this. Janet reads it. Janet says, what, is this true? Is this? And Mitsui smiles happily, yes. 
and they grab each other's hands and dance around the bear. Janet, I can't believe you won at the Supreme Court. And this is based on um, uh, an actual interview with the with her friend Janet, who um, who basically uh, spelled out that or mentioned that on the news they they danced around the barracks, which I just think is a wonderful moment. Um, to this was the my initial sketch of that scene on the left, and then the final is on the right, and um, I wanted to. Um, give the moment where she read the telegram some time. So um, uh, this is uh, a device in graphic novels where you can sort of slow down or speed up the story um, graphically um, without, without words at all. But um, uh, while this wasn't in the original treatment, I, I just added this in because I thought it was important enough to, um, to have her, you know, rip open the telegram, read it, and then have the shock and recognition of uh, realization of uh, her good news. And then um, she runs across the barracks. Um, and uh, this was a scene that eventually got cut, which was just kind of making more of, of the, 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 uh, of her running and, and the anticipation of telling her friend. Um, but I think we all agreed, uh, the team agreed that that, that was superfluous um, and that um, the initial moment was important and showing her running across the barracks was important. And for these scenes, um, there is a great uh, home movie, color home movie, um, eight millimeter home movie of uh, the Topaz uh, camp from Dave Tatsuno from 19... Uh, 41. And um, here I had uh, a great resource to to show what the post office actually looked like and the colors and uh, and he actually climbed up on a roof to to uh, give me a nice aerial shot, um, which which, you know, there's Endo running in the context of the vast camp. And I, um, I really like that moment. And then in the final page, um, she comes running in and says, Janet, Janet, and, um, uh, and they read it and they dance. And this is a case where um, at this stage in the process, I, I was a little ignorant about the construction of the camps at this point. Um, in the initial assembly centers, uh, families were all kind of thrown together in, uh, in a shared barracks. But um, by the time they were in um, the relocation camps, they um, had individual rooms, and so that helped construct this scene. Um, and then um, the final scene was her um, uh, handing off the Western Union telegram. Um, I did want to mention that um, Frank also found this photograph of Janet, her friend, um, outside of the very barracks where the dancing had taken place. And so this allowed me to uh, reconstruct the interior um, more accurately than I otherwise would have. So, so that's just a, a kind of a brief um, summary of uh, one part of the story. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's our jobs to tell each other that yeah. <laughs> um, I need to unmute. Thank you so much, Ross. That was really educational. I think um, you described those images of the home and the Capitol in the background and some of the research that you did, both the historical research and the current perspective. And I mean, that was just for one particular image and panel in the book. And so I can imagine that it must have taken quite some effort and time to put all of this together. Yes, there were, um, uh, Frank, in, in all his years of uh, uh, studying this period, had a treasure trove of uh, visual reference, but then I also had to find some things on my own, um, and, you know, Google's an amazing source, and, um, um, and there's a local source up here in Seattle called the Densho Digital Repository, and that is... Um, 
you know, generations of uh, Japanese American families, uh, family pictures collected in one place, and um, uh, that there were they were just um, uh, untold resources for for illustrating almost every scene um, as accurately as possible. So. Um, you know, buildings that have been torn down, long torn down, neighborhoods that are long gone, and um, and having photographs of, of all of it is uh, uh, it was just great to be able to to find them all. Yeah, most of the images that I've seen from this time are in black and white, mm -hmm. um, and so I was surprised when you showed the image of topaz in color. Um, did you struggle with that at all in terms of trying to deal with the color issue because the graphic um, was in color? Right, right. Uh, there, there. Um, I, I uh, one thing I, I wanted to do as sort of a device was to, you know, we have three stories in this book, and I, I illustrated two of them, but I wanted to differentiate between the two, and so the Endo story and the Akutsu story are. I use two separate uh, color palettes. It's, they're subtly different, but I, I, I know they're <laughs> they're different. Um, where uh, Endo story in set in California is a little kind of rosier and and a little brighter than the Seattle kind of greens and uh, grays um, and uh, also um, Dan Schaefer at Chin Music, um, the book designer, um, supplemented that with page coloring differentiation as well. But in terms of accuracy, there there were there are some color photos uh, of the time, and um, I I use that like for some fashions. Um, there were you know people took color photos in the camps. Um, that that eight millimeter movie um, it's quite extensive, and that that was a great resource. Um, I found late in the game. I found um, a color photo or a color movie. Uh, of someone driving down uh, Michigan Avenue in Chicago and um, Endo ends up in Chicago. And uh, from that movie, I, could, I saw a bus go by and I really wanted to get the accurate coloring of the buses because that's just, you know, I, I think that's important to be accurate to the city colors. And so uh, the accurate, there was actually a bus and um, that gave me the color for that bus. And, um, so that was just a fun little extra piece of accuracy that uh, that was available. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think the next question I'm going to pose to Frank, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the attorneys who are portrayed. Um, I think there are at least three. Um, there was James Purcell and Wayne Collins, who you've talked about. There's also the other attorney who represented Jim Akutsu, who told him that he basically had no case to plead guilty um, in his trial after resisting the draft. But the two attorneys um, who are featured, Purcell and Collins, were the ones who were re really willing to stand up and represent the Japanese Americans when very few people were, either you know politically or legally, I think. And the Purcell lawsuit, the Endo lawsuit, did lead to the settlement offer where Ms. Endo could have been um, basically released early. And as the book points out, when Wayne Collins was coming to visit Tule Lake, they shut down the Stockdale before he could arrive and before he could actually see it. And so to me, that actually shows the impact that pressure, in this case, really legal pressure, put on these efforts. And so I'm wondering, and I'm curious if it occurred to you um, what it might have been like if more people had been like those two attorneys or had protested or um, really if that theme of these attorneys having that much of an impact was something that you thought about in creating this book. That's a very interesting question, Kara. Um, no, because I, I, I only worked with the historical record that we have. These are the only two attorneys who really stood up. Uh, you know, Roger Baldwin, the executive director of ACLU National at the time, uh, was friends with FDR, and he actually um, supported the, he, he permitted the mass e exclusion to occur and uh, opposed uh, test cases 
uh, challenging the constitutionality of the eviction, for example, from the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee draft resistors found no relief from the ACLU. Uh, Roger Baldwin told them they had no case. Um, so uh, if there had been more support, uh, you know, if we had more injunctions filed in district court uh, at the time, um, not just a habeas corpus case, but other, other causes of action, that would have been wonderful. But you know what, Kara? Um, it was our own community leadership as embodied by the Japanese American Citizens League and Mike Masaoka, as we show in the book, who pulled the rug out from any uh, protest against the actual, the initial eviction, um, because they, they simply said, we waive our right to protest. Uh, it would be wrong for us to protest because that would be unpatriotic. Uh, we got to do our duty. Um, it's for the war effort. And, um, and, they, and they actively suppressed. Uh, and, uh, and oppose any actions to um, contest eviction. So, you know, there, there really was no, no place to go. The only, the only real help the Japanese Americans got at the time was from the Quakers, American Friends Service Committee. And that was humanitarian aid, you know, uh, food baskets, visits, visits in camp. Uh, but but um, the, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, a more concerted legal defense uh, front at the time would have been fantastic. And I... Uh, we, I think we learned from that uh, with um, the current um, situations in the last five years with kids in cages and Muslim travel ban. Well, Muslim travel ban, I mean, goodness gracious, all, all the lawyers in the country um, in blue states uh, so descended on them and filed briefs uh, contesting the Muslim travel ban as, as unconstitutional based on, on religion. Right. And I do see a question in the Q&A about um, sort of the parallels between now and then. So I think we'll, we will get there. I think there's a question in there. Yeah, um, so from, from Chris Eng, he, he asked about the current practice of caging immigrant children at our borders and separating families. And family separations uh, triggered a massive, not a massive, but a, a, a widespread reaction from progressive Japanese Americans, thank goodness. Uh, you know, uh, we had this experience. Uh, it gives us a certain moral authority to speak about it. And I, I always maintain a certain moral responsibility to stand in, in defense of those who are targeted today, uh, just as our families were back in, in 1942. So the Suru for Solidarity movement uh, arose. And um, well, one, one point I want to make uh, to Chris is that um, our, the Japanese American experience of family separation was in one in reverse. In our case, it was our fathers who were separated from the families. Uh, Jim Akutsu's father separated from his family, uh, you know, months out, two months after Pearl Harbor, uh, FBI arrests on December 7th and in February uh, of the Japanese American Issei community leaders, they were sent to Justice Department internment camps in uh, Montana and North Dakota and New Mexico. These were family separations, but in reverse. And the, the families went to term, in, incarceration camps and the fathers went to Justice Department uh, alien internment camps. Right, but, thank you. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I, I, sorry uh, Carl, go ahead. Oh, I want to finish my point about the, um, uh, uh, the pseudo for solidarity movement. Uh, the, Chris asks what impact do these seizures efforts have in fact, the protest at, I believe it was Fort Sill, Oklahoma, at the site of a potential uh, family detention center for asylum seekers on the southern border. The protests there, uh, friends of mine put their bodies on the line, uh, and the government, in fact, backed down from making Fort Sill a family detention center. So th there, there was a tangible evidence of uh, the protest having an effect on government policy. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned the JCL, and the book has some very pointed um, conversations um, between the JCL and the government in a way that I think hasn't really been showcased before. I know that there's a little bit that I've seen about the role of the JCL and sort of their real active role. And so I'm curious, I guess, as to how you found that source material, um, as well as um, any thoughts that you may have about the placement of those pieces throughout the book where the JCL parts are sort of interspersed at various points? We, I interspersed them at various points to drive the story. I mean, you can't talk about resistance in camps without showing what they're resisting against. So we show DeWitt and Bendetson, the architects of the, of the incarceration, and we show Mr. Mike Basaoka of JCL uh, 
collaborating with the government, uh, setting government policy in the camps, you know, no Buddhism, no Japanese language, uh, we want assimilation, we want uh, uh, reinstitution of the draft in camp. Um, I, I got them, Kara, over the last 40 years, at first from people like Michi Wegwin, author of Views of Infamy and Eiko Herzig. They would send my, Frank Chin and I these, these JCL memos that they found in the National Archives. Uh, uh, and we would start writing about them and talking about them. And uh, the, you know, our work to bring JCL's collaborate policy of both informing on the Issei community before Pearl Harbor, which led to the swift arrest by the FBI, and their policy of cooperation and collaboration with to smooth the uh, movement into camps. Um, triggered a, an internal investigation by JCL in 1980s. Uh, uh, and it was in fact called the Lim, the Deborah Lim Report, San Francisco attorney wrote, uh, she had access to the JCL archives. She wrote uh, the, the Lim Report. It's all online on, on my website, resistors.com. I, I put it online. And, and she documented all these quotes that I put in the graphic novel. So it these are all words drawn from, and scrupulously, I might add, uh, drawn from the words of Mike Masaoka and others um, protesting their loyalty, you know, um, and urging uh, cooperation with incarceration and suppressing resistance and you know, suppressing protest. Uh, so it, it, it drives the story, but that's the, that, that was the story. I mean, it, this is our history. And you're right, it's not, it's not highlighted because it wasn't, it's, wasn't polite to talk about it. Uh, right. So I, I'm, I'm, I hope this book helps center that conversation <laughs> after after 80 years of uh, not talking about it. Right, right. Okay, and I just wanted to clarify a couple things. There is a question in the chat as to what is the JCL, and that is the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, and then I also just wanted to clarify for anybody who doesn't know, when Frank referenced the Issei people, and that's basically first generation um, Japanese who came over. Um, from Japan. And so as the Issei and then the, the Nisei are also mentioned in the book as second generation. Um, and we're Sansei. Are I'm you actually, Sansei? I'm Sansei and Yonsei. Yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm Nisei and Sansei. Yeah. Yes. So that's third, third and fourth. Third, third is Sansei and fourth is Yonsei. Um, yes. There is also a question in the chat that I think is really for Ross, but I've lost sort of the first part of it. But the question basically is has to do with the illustrations and the different formats. And Ross, you answered part of this question, I think, already. But my understanding is that you um, illustrated, you didn't illustrate the, um, the Kashiwagi segment of the book. Um, the other illustrator did that. And it is in a very different format um, from the other two and also has I think a lot more text associated with that. And so I don't know, it, was there a deliberate decision made um, to, to format it in that way? Yeah, we, I mean, the part of our mandate um, for this project, uh, the Wing Loop Museum um, basically had a call for artists and authors. And so there were two writers and two illustrators in this project. And so um, that was, that was, Kind of part of our the mandate going to, to begin and so it was, there was some uh just internal discussion about how to how to best organize that when we were first doing you know the, the very early stages of the book and what we um uh, uh decided on was that um we would we weren't even sure how many stories, main stories there would be. And we ended up with these three. And um, so the decision was that um, Matt Sasaki um, would, would take the um, Kashiwagi story and the, the, the kind of the, um, the Tule Lake part of the story, which was much more of a kind of visceral, kind of sort of fits his, uh, more uh, abstract style and more kind of emotional style. And um, whereas the other two stories were more about um, kind of individual characters, um, I mean, for lack of a better description, I guess, but, um, um, and maybe Frank can address that a little as well. But um, 
that that was basically it, I think. And, and Matt's style is just very uh, is much looser, and um, uh, which I think is um, is part of the the more text uh, part of it. Uh, I wasn't really part of that collaboration. I mean, uh, my relationship with the writers was much more uh, give and take, I think, and we. Um, we were seeing how, what we could do with illustration, what we could do with uh, dialogue and, and kind of try to find a balance of that. And so, um, uh, so I think that's, that's basically it. Okay. I want to add that Ross is very adept at, at, at drawing uh, dramatic scenes and, 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 and illustrating um, scenes that unfold. Uh, and, and Matt's strength was in drawing sharp images with you know, expressionistic images to which I then realized I had to write longer narration to basically explain what's happening in the in this drawing. So two different approaches to to art and to um, sequential art uh, all on the page, um, but they, they, but they both seem to they they they, they do complement each other in, in readers' eyes. I, we found. Right. So it sounds like it was quite an iterative process to put this together in terms of the text and the illustrations. Oh yeah, many, over four years. Many yes. iterations. Yes. Yeah. Many iterations. <laughs> <laughs> many, many iterations. Yes. Okay, we, we have another question in the chat from Christina Stevenson who says, I stopped by an internment camp in Colorado this summer. I learned that the Japanese Americans there taught the white residents of the surrounding towns innovative farming techniques from the Pacific coast. They seem to develop a kind of at least economic relationship with the town. Was this interaction with the white communities a purposeful ploy to justify drafting interned Japanese Americans into the war? Interesting question. Uh, and uh, there really was no relationship between the two. Uh, the, the farming was the farming, the, the human interaction was the human interaction. And the decision to draft the Nisei was one, again, demanded by JACL at the start of the war. And, and finally, uh, the War Department, John J. McCloy, agreed uh, to it. and. We instituted the draft of the Nisei in January of 1944 uh, because they needed soldiers, quite frankly, and because they wanted to give the Japanese Americans a chance to serve um, and to just to to prove and, and as they did prove themselves in combat, uh, their their record was one of valor. Um, but no, there's no no direct relationship, no 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 hidden agenda there. Okay, so a lot of the the book questions or discusses loyalty. Um, the book goes into the issues of the no-no boys, specifically their responses to questions 27 and 28 on the loyalty question. And then at the end talks about how there really wasn't a real penalty or law regarding a requirement to respond to those questions. Yeah. So do you know, were there actual, um, I have always heard of the, the no-no boys, th those individuals who said no, in response to those two questions, but did people not respond? Hiroshi Kashiwaki refused, many re simply said, I refuse to answer this question. Uh, and um, the government being uh, a government and accepting only a binary yes, no, yes, no, uh, demanded the answer and they finally forced them to answer no. So they scrolled in. And so we show that in Hiroshi's case, he, he finally scrawled in no under, under protest. Yeah, the, the other thing that I found interesting um, was the focus in the book about the renunciation of citizenship and sort of the pressure that was applied to do that. Um, so within the, there was a fairly dramatic scene where the ship was actually going to be leaving and then basically was stopped and it came back um, and, and they didn't leave. Um, and this term, I guess, was adopted, a Native American alien um, Isn't that, that is something? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because the, because these these Japanese Americans born in Sacramento and elsewhere, as U.S. citizens under the Fourteenth Amendment with birthright citizenship, uh, were persuaded for one reason or another, usually family pressure and a fear of being separated, to renounce their citizenship, but they did not have citizenship in Japan, uh, so they became stateless persons, and then, uh, you know the government needed to classify them somehow. And so they were not aliens and then they were not citizens. They were born, they were Native Americans and they were aliens. Um, it's a curious term. 
It is a curious term. And it's also curious that those people who did renounce them would be stateless, which led me to my next question as to if they were to actually have gone on the ship and gone to Japan, what would have happened to them once they got there? Um, you know, they, they were not welcomed because, of course, Japan, even about 44, uh, was devastated. People were starving. Uh, no one had, you know, the, those who had families, uh, fa you know, their, fa their families could not feed them, house them. Uh, so they become a burden. They were just a burden on everyone. Some got jobs with the, with the U.S. Army, in fact, as uh, translators or uh, other, other kinds of aides uh, to the occupation army. Um, but uh, it was just, it was just, it's just, it's just a tragic story. And I, I bring it, I brought it up because a lot of Sacramentans, you know, were, were at Tule Lake and renunciation is like the dirtiest of dirty linen in, in our community. A little understood uh, and I hope explained a little bit by, by the story in this novel. Right, yes, thank you. So I did want to note um, and congratulate you that your first printing actually sold out, I understand very quickly. I had a difficult time actually obtaining a hard copy because it was out of stock at our local bookstores and wasn't going to be restocked for um, some time. Yes. Um, it sounds like you're in a second printing now, is that right? The, thankfully, mercifully, the second printing was is, is at the book distributors now. Back orders are slowly being fulfilled. And hopefully, for example, Capital Books in Sacramento should be getting their stock we, uh, by next week, uh, uh, at the latest, I hope. Uh, but go ahead and place your orders with Capital Books and other independent booksellers in Sacramento. And uh, that the second printing has arrived. So that, and it took a and long a, time. Yes. A third printing is cute, getting queued up. As we speak, yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. And so as a graphic novel, is this intended to be used for um, younger audiences? Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it's uh, educators have said they found it useful as a overview of the entire incarceration experience uh, outside of the story of, of camp resistance. <clears throat> and there is an educator's guide that will, will be posted mm -hmm. online very soon uh, for, sec for secondary schools. And I'm also finishing up an online interactive historical timeline uh, that you can click on to see all the events in the book and then click on to pop up bubbles with the primary documents like the JECL memos that I quoted from in the script, uh, like the DeWitt and, and Bidnetson conversations that were recorded uh, telephone transcripts that, that we used for the, those scenes, uh, like the telegram uh, for, to Mitzi Endo, uh, to her attorney. So um, yeah, uh, we're, we're expecting a lot of interest from, from educators this fall. Oh, that's great. And will that be made available on your website? It would be on the wingloop.org slash curriculum website, yes. Okay, the website, wing, yes. okay. Yeah. And that's the museum in Seattle, is that correct? The Wingloop Museum in Seattle commissioned uh, the graphic novel right. and, and hired the four of us uh, to, to work on the project. Okay, that's, and, that's exciting. Uh -huh. And that uh, curriculum uh, link is also on the inside front cover. Oh, yeah, book, that's right. So. <laughs> okay, that's handy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions in the chat. And we are right at six o'clock when I believe our program is supposed to end. Yes, Frank. I, I have one more announcement to make. Uh, in Sacramento, the federal, are you, are you familiar, Kara, with the Federal Judiciary Center Library, the Anthony M. Kennedy Library? Oh, yes. Center? Uh -huh. They're, they're going to have an exhibit, a poster exhibit starting September 20th featuring oh, okay. uh, the Mitsuya Endo story, all of Ross's drawings mounted on panels on the wall in the uh, Anthony N. Kennedy uh, mm -hmm. Library and Learning Center. So admissions free, uh, space features multiple exhibits, uh, including this Endo exhibit, the pages that we've been showing you. And it's open Monday through Friday, 9, 9, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So go, 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 go check that out. Okay, that's great. That's exciting. Thank yes. you for sharing that. Yeah. And, so and, and, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm done. No, please. I'm done. Uh, the, uh, we t the books will be available uh, very soon, uh, wherever fine books are sold. Um, I went on uh, the website of the Chin Music Press today, and it looks like um, they will start selling them again September 1st. So you yes. can go directly to the publisher, um, or you could go to Capital Books. I put the link in the chat. Or you go to the library. Or you can go to the library. Of course. <laughs> I should always say that. So um, 
this has been like my most favorite authors uncovered ever. It was so fascinating. Thank you for all of the history and your all that information about the research, Frank, Ross, finding out how you put, you know, the panels together and how you chose your images. That's just so fascinating. And Kara, you're invited to be a facilitator anytime you want. That was amazing. Amazing. So everyone, thank you so much for coming here. Um, we had a, a great turnout and I'm so pleased. Um, we have more Authors Uncovered events happening in uh, September and October. So check our website for those events. They will be honoring um, Latino Heritage Month. So we're going to have a great panel of, po of poets and another author. Um, there's no graceful way to do this. So I'm going to end the webinar and then we'll just all be gone. So thank you. Thank you. Well, first I'm going to read the, first I'm going to read the chat because everyone seems so happy about this event and I'm so happy that you're happy. That's my job. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.